69 feeling. Like some of the air comes out. Mm -hmm. It looks, one guy, one time I had a guy, he told me, Rabbi, they made a defect. They left the strings coming out, so I cut it with a razor. I told you, fool, you just made it feeling not kosher. <laughs> Supposed to come out. That's what Hashem showed Moshe Rabbeinu. It has to come out. So it takes about a year. A year. There's a film, How to Make It. They show you all the process. One, two, step, step. Sometimes you walk 10 months, boom, it becomes nakosher. Sometimes you're so fair. Think about it. You have four chapters in a head, four chapters in a, in a hand. You have thousands of letters to write with, with a feather. You dip it in the ink, you go, you write, you write, you write, you write, boom! Became pasul. Two hours you just walk, three hours you just walk, became pasul. You cannot save it. Why? Because you have to shave everything in reverse mm -hmm. to the place of the mistake. What happens if you have the name of Hashem? If the name of Hashem is written, you cannot erase the name of Hashem. Or what happened after you finish the old filin, you give it to the other sofer that checks it, and you say, look at here, the hey of Hashem is touching the vav. That's it. Well, you cannot erase in the name of Hashem. So the whole work of two days went down the drain. It's a very frustrating job. In the end, they make a few hundred dollars on a parashiot, which takes them about two days to write. After you take off the cloth and the person who makes the crowns on the leather and the computer scan and all that, they basically make what a Spanish guy in a supermarket makes, wrapping your vegetables and fruits in bags, $15 an hour, that's more or less what they make, maybe $20 an hour. It's a joke. Sad joke, such professional holy people that do the work of Hashem make so little. If they would make it fill in in America, a good one like this would probably be six, seven, or eight thousand dollars a pair for amount of work in it. Because in America, nobody would do it for fifteen, twenty dollars an hour. It would be minimum fifty dollars an hour. And you count the amount of hours and the cost of material, and there's also different qualities of leathers. Apparently, American leather is very good. It's not every leather is the same quality. Some tefillin will remain will last 20, 25 years. Some can last seven years. Depend on the quality of the leather. It's also making differences in the price. Some tefillin they put glue in the bottom to hold it together. Why? Because otherwise, after a while, it opens up. It's four pieces in the head. They begin to, with humidity and heat, they open open completely. Then the tefillin doesn't look square anymore. So they put in the bottom a little glue. It keeps it together. But of course, without glue, it's much higher level. If you know how to make it. Bottom line, you just got a little lesson about tefillin. And that's finally... Finally, I can say that this feeling is the best you can find on earth now. But the problem is that it's not enough. It's not enough. You cannot get enough. I got four. They were all sold in two days. And next week, after Shavuot, someone's bringing five more pairs, and that will be now probably for a month. Because it's, uh, everybody fights, competes. Uh, <laughs> I had to tell the guy, listen, I'm giving you right now an order for 100. I thought, um, wow, he's going to grab it. I said, wow, <laughs> I need your order for 100. I can sell We make X amount of, we cannot, you can give me an order of 1,000. There's an X amount that we can do here. It's all handmade, one by one. What do you think? It's not commercial. Baruch Hashem. Let's move on. We read in the Torah, אם בחוקותיי תלכו ואת מצוותיי תשמרו, חז"ל, לאור החיים, אול דה מפרשים, דה אקספליין, אם בחוקותיי תלכו, שתהיו עמלים בתורה. לאור החיים גב 42 explanations for this verse, 42, different ones. אם בחוקותיי תלכו, if you follow my laws, meaning you will give your life 
to learn Torah. Not just to learn, you're not in a library here. You're not in a history lesson or math. And you have to get your degree. That's, forget about it. We're talking now that the Torah will become your oxygen, your life. Can't live without it. The ask of Gershon Adelstein, I think he's close to 100 years old by now. One of the top nine rabbis in the world. Are you going tomorrow to Meron, Kvod Arav? Meron? We learn Torah, what Meron? We're going to waste the whole day schlepping on the buses to go to Meron or in cars, in traffic? We sit and learn Torah. What Mer million Meron is now one hour of learning Torah. Million days you go to Meron. Million. Million Lagba Omer is now one hour of learning Torah. The Satan is a genius. You have a diamond in your hand. It's going to make you sacrifice the diamond to get a quarter. A coin. Here, give a 10 carat diamond, I'll give you a quarter. If someone will do such deal, what is he? But how do you explain that we're not going to the grave of uh, David Ben-Gurion, Shem Reshaim Irkab. We're going to a grave of uh, Tana Eloki, one of the most important people that live in the history of the world, one of the top five people, Rashbi Akadosh. We're not going to a grave of somebody. We're going to a grave of a holy Tana, Mechaye Metim, he wrote the Zohar. Wow, Rabbi Shimon. Still. If you happen to pass by, you're driving one day over there and you see a grave of a tzaddik, quickly you jump inside, read Tehilim, say some prayers, and move on. To leave the Torah and to go to Kivrot Tzadikim, you lose a lot more than what you gain. You should know that. Don't be fooled by all these hundreds are going. Thousands are going. You will never see one Gdola door go to Rashbi on Lag Baumi. Not Rav Uvadia, not Rav Ben Zion, not Rav El Yashiv, not Rav Chaim Kanievsky, not Rav Adelstein, none. Now one of Gdolei Ador ever went. Not to Uman and not to Lag Baumi by Rashbi. Or to any other Ilula. Never. When you see Rav Chaim Kanievsky close the Gemara, and go to Meron to light a, a, a candle there, then forget what I said. But until then, you have no permission to forget what I just told you. Don't ever be fooled by all this. We're organizing buses. That's the Satan orchestrates the whole thing. And there's a reason why Hashem punished us right there. Could have done it in many different places. To show you I'm tired of this culture already. That's it became the main thing in Judaism. Kivrot Sadikim, Tiulim, let's go here, let's go there, Ish Balia there, we must go, Rabbeinu will save the world. It's already on the border of idol worshipping. Very, very close to become Christians. Come back, come back to Torah, come back to Tshuva, come back to other things. Enough with this. You gotta get rid of this kind of idea. <sighs> yes, yes, Rabotai. This is what it is. <laughs> so now the question is, the Torah say if you're gonna be devoted to Torah and you keep mitzvot, what is going to be your reward? What, the to what we just read in Parashat Bechukotai. V'natati gishmechem beitam. Rain in Israel, you don't have too much of it. Usually, Israel does not have rain like what rained here in the last three, four days. I don't know, in Brooklyn, but in Monsi, it rained three days in a row. That's usually months of the winter in Israel. What, ra what rained here, you step on your grass, you're sinking. <laughs> so much rain, this grass will take it two weeks to dry out. Why? Baruch Hashem is a blessed place, non-stop rain. Every week you have at least one day of rain. And now three or four in a row. Even when it rains in Israel, it's maximum half an hour and it starts. You don't have like this, three days in a row rain. Three days in a row. It doesn't stop for a second. 
pouring rain. You don't have a little bit rain here, a little bit rain there, an hour here, half an hour there, five minutes here. All together we survive. So when you have so little rain, the timing is critical. You need it to be divided perfectly. You grow this, you grow that. If the rain will come all in one week and then six month drought, <laughs> it's the end of us. So that, that's a blessing. I will give your rain in perfect timing. Be'itam. Be'itam. Tov? Meaning, if the rain, the first rain of the season will come one week early, it will ruin all the tomatoes, all the wheat, whatever you're growing. If it will come two weeks later, everything will dry and die. So you need it around Sukkot. Usually first rainfall in Cholamo at Sukkot. How do I know? Every year it rains on us in a Sukkah in Israel. That's where it starts. Baruch Hashem. So, first I'll give you rain on time. Then I will make peace in the land. Third, your enemies will not stab you, will not fight you. And there's a list of things. You will multiply, you will have blessing in giving birth, no one will be barren. You sleep well at night with no fear. So there is a huge reward for learning Torah and keeping mitzvot, as we read. But I don't understand one thing. The Gemara says in Masechet Kiddushin, Schar mitzvot be'ai al maleka. Don't expect to get rewarded for your mitzvot in this world. The reward of your mitzvot is all for the next world. I don't understand. You have a whole page promising reward if we're going to keep mitzvot. Black on white. And what do you think? The Chachamim did not know parashat bechukotai by heart? Much better than me and you, that's for sure. So how do they ignore what's written? Of course they don't. It means that we didn't understand. Let's try to understand it together. Second question, why there is now one word in the Torah about the reward of the afterlife? Can't explain it. Why the Torah doesn't say, I will reward you in the next world? Huh? The Gemara say all the reward is for the next world. But in a Torah, what does it mean that the reward is in this world? It's not possible to explain. Ah, so let's see. The Rambam explained that over here, all this list of things that the Torah promised, if we're going to listen to Hashem and follow His mitzvot and learn a lot of Torah, is not a reward. It's removing the obstacles in Avodat Hashem. It's not a reward. There are things in life that do not let you learn Torah and keep mitzvot. Survive. Poverty, mental diseases, physical diseases, cruel enemy who constantly come to kill you, problems in making a living, no rain, nothing to eat, you're hungry, you're dying, you're, you cannot focus, you cannot have children, you sit home depressed for 20 years. All these things are obstacles in Avodat Hashem. It's like sticking a stick into the wheel of your bike. So now the Torah say, devote yourself for learning Torah and keep mitzvot. Slowly, slowly, I will remove all the obstacles. You will have children, you will make money, the Arabs will go to sleep for 2,000 years. <laughs> Everything will work out for you. Why? Because you went in Bechukotai. In Bechukotai Telechu. It's true that every kosher Jew wants to be righteous. Who doesn't want to be righteous? Raise his hand. 
ברוך השם, יהיו נורמל. Who thinks is right she's racism? Besides him, everyone here is honest. Or humble, one of the two. I said that in yeshiva that I spoke, who thinks he's a tzaddik here? Nobody raised their hands. And Baruch Hashem, Rabbi, you see, all your talmidim are honest. He told me, no, they're actually humble. Meaning, he testified that they are tzaddikim. But they don't want to raise their head. Meaning, they don't make sins. Tov. So, Baruch Hashem, we have one tzaddik in Sdom. Raising his hand with no fear, Baruch Hashem. There's only one thing you should know. You better be right. <laughs> Because if not, you will regret raising the hand. And you stand in front of Hashem and say, what do you think? You're tzaddik? Of course. You have no hesitation. No hesitation whatsoever. I get, I get a, such a smack. Wake up from your dream. Wake up, my friend. Anyway, so now, <laughs> so what is the reason we are not tzaddikim? Chazal has an expression. Seor sheba'isa me'akev. Seor. You have a huge pile of dough. And one, in the door, there is one piece of wheat stuck with it. What's going to happen now? It's like the Yetzirah penetrates our heart. So the Gemara say, what are the reasons that a person will not be a tzaddik? One, the evil inclination, Yetzirah. Two, Shibud Malchuyot, the Goim, the Romans, the Greeks. Today you don't need Goim, you have Erev Rav, Arabs. So the Gemara say, Shibud Malchuyot, the Goim don't give you a rest. Rockets, missile, another war, anti Semitism, this, that. No, no, no rest. <laughs> so the Torah say, okay, so let me give you an advice. You do your max. Leave the rest for me. Give your life for the Torah. Show me you're really serious. Do the best you can to keep mitzvot. Show me you're really serious. And I'll do the rest. Slowly, slowly, I will remove all the obstacles on your path. When you have peace, you can have a peace of mind to learn. If you have rockets falling, you can learn. Only if you Chacham Ovadia Yosef. <laughs> He was learning when the Prime Minister of Israel stood next to him with his bodyguards with walkie-talkie in a room and didn't realize for half an hour they're standing in his room. Because <laughs> he's in a different planet when he learns. Stop. The Ibn Ezra, in Parashat Azino, he says, this is about the Gemara in Brachot Lamed Daled, page 34, All the prophets spoke their prophecy about someone, listen carefully, that marry his daughter to a Talmud Chacham. Shalom, Moshe. Hi, Shalom. Who is speaking? This is Mrs. Cohen. Yes, where are you from? I am the Shatchan, Shatchanit. I heard you have a daughter. And Baruch Hashem, she's a great girl, very religious. I have a few boys here that maybe could be good for her. Can I hear? Okay. One is a very serious learner. He learns his Baal Midot, but he's very poor. There's another one, very modern, is planning now to go to university in Manhattan, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and he comes from a very wealthy family, and he's going to be a great doctor. Which one of the two I should send to you, Mr. Cohen? Which resume you want? 
If he said, what, what university now? You're wasting my time. I want to know the learner, the Ben Torah. Of course, of course. And then it worked out, and he married his daughter to a Talmud Chacham. Poor. He's going to pay all the bills. He's going to pay the rent. He's going to pay the wedding. As long as his daughter is attached to a holy Talmud Chacham Tzaddik Yereshamayim. Nothing impressed him. Not a rich family. Not a doctorat. Nothing. Just Torah and Irat Shamayim. That's what the Torah meant. The Ibn Ezra is one of the important commentaries on the Torah. 750 years ago. Second, someone who gives everything that the Talmud Chacham needs. What do you need, Rabbi? Why are you driving such a lousy car? No air condition, shaking, making noise, get stuck every other day. I want to get you a nice car that you can run around peacefully without breaking your head. No, no, it's okay. I manage with that 25 years. I'll manage another 25 years. That's only in Israel, Rabbi. Here it's in America, you can't drive a car like this. I would like to get you a normal car. It have to be a fancy one, but at least reliable. That's what the Torah talks about. Mehane talmid chacham Every time you go to Israel, Rabbi, I have an apartment there in Bnei Brak or Yerushalayim, the key is yours. You can live there, don't rent hotel, and I have a car there, you can drive it. And if you need a driver, I ask someone to drive you around. That's called me'ane talmidei chachamim in chasav. That's a very high level of a Jew. Very high level. But there is a higher level. One higher, much higher. Who is the higher? What, what are you going to do with that, these girls? They know better than the Bachorei Shiva. The one that learns is even higher than the one who says, I'll give everything you want, Chacham. It's all on me. Very nice. The actual Talmidei Chachamim, Ayn lo ata elokim zulatcha, Yaase la mechake lo. There is no words to describe their spiritual eternal reward to the next world. Words cannot describe it. And if HaKadosh Baruch Hu would speak about the Olam Abba, the next word in the Torah, anyway, no one will know 1% of what he's talking about. Because it's a different language, different level of pleasure. It's a higher spiritual pleasure, and you do not have any of this pleasure in this world. So it will be like explaining to a blind person what the color blue is. Can you explain to a blind person, was born blind? Can you explain to him how lovely is color blue or white or whatever it is? He has no idea what you're talking about. So what's, why wasting time? Wasting time. Nobody would understand a word about it. Rabenu Bechaye, another one of Gdolea Rishonim, close to a thousand years ago. It says, we all know there is a, there is a verse in the Torah that I, I'm testing you to see if you keep my mitzvot, that I should reward you in your end. Meaning when you leave this world, the reward will start. It's a normal thing. The Torah does not have to speak about something that is different than the nature. Meaning simple common sense. I will be righteous for 80 years. And my neighbor will be wicked for 80 years. And in this world, it looks like we both have the same. I have a house, he has a house. I have a car, he has a car. He has children, I have children. He's healthy, I'm healthy. He eats well, I eat well. He dress well, I dress well. It may even possible that this Rasha has more than what I have. Better car, better home, more children, right or wrong? So what are the alternatives? That I work for nothing, that Hashem Chas V'Shalom is a liar? 
all this will be for nothing. Wicked and righteous will have the same end. Obviously not. It's against the law of nature. Especially when Hashem keeps repeating the fact that he's a fair judge and he doesn't take bribe and he pays everyone exactly what they deserve. So if you didn't see it yet, it's yet to come. It's just a matter of time. It's simple common sense. I said once, if somebody thinks that Adolf Hitler in Machshimo, after killing 50 million people, his entire punishment was five seconds of suffering, then he's a total moron. Excuse my language. What did he do? Took a gun. Psh! How, much, how long was the pain? Two seconds, a second and a half? Blow up the brain? Doesn't feel anything? Fail and die. Here in this world, we see righteous people suffer so much. Cancer, problem, losing their hair, surgeries, uh, pain, back pain, uh, bankruptcy, missiles fall on their house. Every average person suffers more than him. So what is the alternative to say what? There is no justice, no judge, no nothing, no supervisor. How can you say such thing? So obviously there's a, there's a continuation. To be continued. To be continued. It's, an, it's enough that the Torah speaks about cut for the soul from the afterlife. Nechreta nefesh. Nefesh is spiritual. That soul will be cut from the afterlife. Then you know. Also, we have a few examples in the Torah that souls came back from the upper world, like Samuel, Shmuel the prophet. King Saul brought his soul back to the world after a while that he was dead already. The fact that the Torah said in three of the 613 commandments do not communicate with the dead, that means they are somewhere. If they will become sent, Right? Under the ground, how exactly I will communicate with them, send them an email? <laughs> how exactly? That means there is a way to communicate with the dead. And from here you know that the dead is somewhere. And there are hundreds of verses that speaks about the souls, such as, The soul of this mister, will be engraved in the life to come. The soul will be in a place of life. What place of life? He died already, the person. So there's many, many places that speaks, but there's also verses that shows that there will be resurrection of the dead. That Aaron will sacrifice in Bet HaMikdash. Aaron never entered the Holy Land. How exactly is going to sacrifice in Bet HaMikdash? Chazal say, from here you learn that there will be resurrection of the dead because Aaron died in a desert and there was no Bet HaMikdash in a desert. There was only a Mishkan. Bet HaMikdash is only in Jerusalem and Aaron one day will sacrifice in Bet HaMikdash in Jerusalem. What do you understand from here? That he will come back. He will come back to life. The Kuzari, the king of Kuzar, he asked Rav Yudha Alevi, had like a question-answer debate. He said, all other religion promise a very fat, juicy world to come. And you, the Jews, what are you giving? A little rain? Some fruit? He was talking about Parashat Bechukotai. That's the reward for listening to God. Christian, believe in JC and you go to heaven. Believe in Muhammad and you go to heaven. With 72, I don't want to tell you what. <laughs> and you, the Jews, be tzaddik, you have more mitzvot than anyone, and what are you going to get for it? Rain. Which Tony in Brooklyn has for free, without keeping mitzvot. Good question or no? So what do you think? 
that Hashem will give Tony and Vinnie, the drug dealers of Brooklyn, non-stop rain as much as they want for their farm, without being righteous. And the righteous people in Israel, thanks to them keeping Shabbat, mitzvot, doing chesed, learning Torah, they'll get a little rain. They can take a shower once a year. Make sense to you? You have to be, like I say, super stupid to even think such thing. It gets better. In the book of Kuzari again, he asks, if in this world Hashem promised that he will walk among us, Can we have a doubt about the next world that he will be with us? In this physical world, Hashem say, if you follow my mitzvot and listen to me, I will live among you. Meaning I will be in the heart of every one of you. Asuli mishkan v'shachanti betocham, in each one of you. I would live inside your soul. You'll be attached to me. That's in this world, when you are in a piece of meat with tons of desire and nonsense. Over there, when it's a pure soul only, needless to say. So, beautiful. Rav Saad Yagaon, a thousand years ago, a little more, answered this question. Before the Torah was given, people used to sacrifice to the sun and the moon and the stars. Because they understood that Hashem made the world runs by the stars, like horoscope. But what happened? The Torah warned us not to sacrifice to those stars. Right? So, slowly, slowly, after a few generations, the Goim got confused. They mixed Hashem and the stars and told the stars have the power to decide what to give us. So the Torah say, you got to be very careful. The Ramban say, the Torah is speaking now about a general reward for the entire Jewish nation as a nation. If most of you will keep mitzvot, you'll be righteous. I'm going to give you peace, security, children, rain, parnasa, no sicknesses, etc. But... The reward of every individual, every wine design is all eternal world. Therefore, the Torah cannot write five million different olam haba for each individual. You want the Torah to describe each world of each individual? It's not possible. When a person died in Israel, what do they write on a flyer when they hang it everywhere? There's no such thing died. There is Allah Leolamo in Israel. Allah Leolamo went to his own world, meaning he designed his own world 100%. The Torah gives the scholars of Torah a very powerful power to control the creation. Everything you see in the world, they are in a power to control the creation. They give energy to the world, and if they say something, the world has to obey, even though there's routine rules, everything runs as usual. If a Talmud Chacham said something, he has the power to overcome their usual regular laws of nature, and we have hundreds of examples of that in the Torah, in the Gemara, in the Prophets, and even in every day's life of, of today. Who can give me a few examples? Guy who was thrown with the lions and the lions didn't eat him. Very good. Daniel. 
Then Daniel, they threw Daniel the prophet with lions that did not eat for days. The lions normally would swallow every other person in less than a minute. Not only did not touch him, they bowed down to him and licked his toes. Did not touch him. Yoshua ben Nun froze the sun in the earth. Why? They needed light at night and there was no night vision yet, made in USA. Soldiers needed to finish the job. That's one of the four times that the sun and the moon and the earth paused. Paused. There's many examples like this. Pinchas ben Yair split the water. Moshe Rabbeinu hit the water, the water split. The ten plagues Moshe and Aaron brought on the Egyptians. The Baba Sali, that was only 30 years ago. Hundreds of witnesses say that there was a party in his house, Mimuna, after Pesach. There was only one bundle of Arak because his wife forgot to buy Arak. And if you know in a house of a Moroccan, if you don't have Arak, it's like a car without the engine. <laughs> so when Baba Sali asked his wife, where is the Arak? Oh, I forgot. Don't worry. He took a towel, he wrapped the bottle like this, wrapped it completely. Nobody, lo nobody saw it. He said to the people, don't look at it. And he poured all night from that bottle to 300 visitors. Keyada Melech. I, to be honest with you, when I hear stories like this, 99.9% .9 immediately I said nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. There's only one problem. I know one person that was there that night and he's not even religious. I said, it's true. I was there. He grabbed it with a towel. So that got me to believe that story maybe 20, 30 percent, which before I didn't believe it, ah, someone made it up. Don't be naive. Not every story you hear, it's true. What's written in the Torah, for sure happened. What's written in the Talmud, for sure happened, or in the prophets. What you hear about the Baal Shem Tov, or Baba Sali, or Ben Ishchai, maybe happened, maybe didn't happen. Why? People love to exaggerate. Oh, the Lubavitch Rebbe built the Varazano Bridge. Yeah, right. Oh, the Babasali made a lake in the desert of Morocco. Because the radiator of the Arab driver exploded. They needed water. So he said, go over there, there's a lake over there. No, maybe yes, maybe not. I once asked my Ashkenazi Rav in Yeshiva, Yudsh Talmid Chacham, he's Litvish. Tell stories like this to the Lidvish, you see how the body begins to shake. I say to him, you believe the stories of the Baal Shem Tov and the Baba Sali? You believe all these stories? <laughs> he, was, he gave me a very diplomatic answer. He said to me, if it happens or not, you don't have to believe. It's not a part of the Torah. But you have to believe that it's possible to happen. If it really happens or not, not you and not me were there to see. Sometimes it happens, sometimes people made it up. But then he says something else. But one thing is for sure. Nobody tells stories like this about me and you. <laughs> you got the point. Well, the day that someone will write about you the things they write about the Baal Shem Tov or the Baba Sali, believe me, you made it. You know, it happened actually in a, in a trial in Europe. They took one rabbi and they blame him for killing a Christian kid and he used his blood for matzot. How dumb they can be with the shtuyot. He, he killed the boy and he took his blood and they make the matzot with the blood of the Christian boy. So the, the lawyer said to the judge, Your Honor, this person, when he delivers a letter to his friend manually, he runs and put the letter in his mailbox. He takes a stamp and he rips rip the stamp. So the, the judge asks why? That the post office will not lose. 
So the judge said to him, come on, where do you get this nonsense from? So the lawyer said to the judge, your honor, if it's true or not, I don't know, but you have to agree that nobody tells story like this about you and me. Do you think someone like this, that that's what people talks about him in the street, is able to kill a person and kill his, and eat his blood? You really think so? So that was very good, impressive uh, argument. But the, the jury still, they want revenge. They want to see the rabbi slaughtered. So they, the lawyer said, the lawyer was religious from the university, and he said to them, Your Honor, please send a messenger to the Jewish neighborhood. Ask any Jewish woman to come into the courtroom. In five minutes, I'll prove to you that the allegation against my client is all fake. The judge got curious. He sent some police. He brought a Jewish woman to the courtroom. He said to her, here is five dollars. Please go to the grocery store and buy eggs. And I want you to demonstrate how do you make an omelet. You don't have to really fry it. Just show the people, well, how do you do it? So the woman went, a Siddish woman, she got a few eggs, she broke them into a jar, and she started to check inside the egg. So uh, the lawyer said, please explain the judge and the jury, what are you looking for? She doesn't know about the case, nothing. It's just they got her from the street. It actually happened. She said, I'm checking to see if there's no drop of blood in the egg. And the lawyer said to her, and if you will find blood, what would happen? I'm throw it away. We're not allowed to eat it. So he said to the judge, Your Honor, one drop of blood we're not allowed to eat. We are religious people, and this is a big rabbi. You really think he used five liters of blood of this Christian <laughs> Tony? That was the end of the case. That was uh, actually turned everything around. Chaim ve'amavet be'yad alashon. Life and death. I would have said the matzah should have been red. <laughs> the matzah, the matzah red. Well, maybe you mix the, the blood with a lot, of, a lot of water and makes it white. Well, they use the blood instead of the no. Maybe the Christian boy has white blood. Oh. <laughs> to convict the Jew, they can make that claim. If you know what I mean. So, one more reason why Hashem did not describe the reward in details in Olam Abba. Because if you would see in the Torah a description of what's going to happen to you in the next world, it will not be any more any test. There's no test. I give you an example. You have a kid. He loves ice cream. You want him to do something he hates to do. If you tell him, I'll give you something nice, will it convince him? Maybe yes, maybe not. But if you show him a ton of ice cream, all colors and this Spring. the sprinkles, cool, uh, candy, you show him, it's all yours if you do what I told you. There's any test anymore? What does normal test can It's going to run, right? Same thing, if the Torah will describe exactly what happened to the wicked people in Gehenom, in hell, not one person will be wicked. Because if you see that it's written in the book of God that that's where you're going for not keeping Shabbat, and that's where you're going for stealing, and that's... You would be frozen without moving your entire life from fear. So the idea is that the Torah speaks about it in few verses. There is afterlife. There are souls. There's ways to even talk to them after they died. A person never dies. It's only transferred to another world. And I will reward you in your end. That's it. And everything else, you have to trust me. The, the Rav Shvadron, one of the greatest speakers of, of our days, 
He told the story that Or Chaim Hakadosh, Rabbi Chaim Ben Atar, from a giant rabbi from Morocco, he used to slaughter every week a cow and give the meat of the cow to all the poor learners in the yeshivot on Friday, that they will have meat for Shabbat. One time, he found that one, that all the cows that were slaughtered that week were all non-kosher. This cow has a hole in the lung, that none of them were kosher. Except the cow that he slaughtered for the, for the poor Talmidei Chachamim, give it to them for free. The rich people of the city of Fas in Morocco, how can they go one Shabbat without meat in the Schena, the Moroccan Chulent? The price was rising like crazy. Where can I get a piece of meat? Now, come to this butcher. I don't have this one. The, the cow with slaughter is not good, not good, not good. I heard the rabbi slaughter and cow came beautiful. But he usually gives it all to the poor people that learns in yeshivot. One of the rich people came to the house of the Orach Haim. Give me one piece of meat, please, for Shabbat. I'll pay whatever you want, Kvod Arav. The rabbi said, I'm sorry. I already gave out all the meat, and I have only one piece left, and that belongs to one Talmid Chacham that did not come to take it yet. Who is that man, the rich person say? He told him the name of that Chacham. He said... That's a Talmud Chacham. I thought you're going to give me some name. The Orach Chaim did not say anything, but did not give him the piece of meat. That night, in a dream, he was told that he is held guilty for not protesting the honor of a Talmud Chacham. As results of that, his punishment is to leave his city and to go to exile just because he did not attack this arrogant rich person that spoke bad about the Chacham, he has to leave his place and go to exile, to live in a stranger country or whatever. So he had to go for Galut. The Gaon Mivil now also went to exile. He came to a motel. There was a wedding there. They suspected him that he, they didn't know who he is. Remember, there was no Google yet. <laughs> Today, you want to know who's the rabbi, you put his, his, his name and you get a picture. Back then, nobody knew who's the Gaon Mivilna, who's the Rambam. They only knew there are people like this, but they didn't know how they look. So he came to a motel, there was a wedding there, and they suspected him that he stole valuable uh, glass or silver or something. And he did not want to say that I did not take. They were beating him up. Boom, boom. Where is it? Boom, where is it? Until they threw him on the street, all bleeding. The grass saw that the Chatan is also smiling. Happy. So he said, Shtabach Shemori Bono Shelolam that I had the marriage to make the Chatan happy on the night of his wedding. Chatan <laughs> That's it. Why he did not tell them that it's not him? Check on me. It's not on me. Gaon Mivilna will ever touch something that it's not his even with a finger? The Gaon Mivilna saw, by mistake, he touched pills. Peels of vegetables, which is mukze. My mistake, he didn't realize. Immediately he fainted on Shabbat. His wife woke him up. Eliyahu! Eliyahu! Vuz machste! He saw the peels again, he fainted. Like this, few times. He wakes up, see the peels, he fainted. His wife realized what's the problem. She took, she woke him up. Eliyahu! She ate it. You see, it's not mukta, it's food. <laughs> he relaxed. The Ariya Kadosh by mistake touched his beard on Shabbat like this. And he remembered Shabbat, he was afraid that if I, if I 
move my hands out of my beard, maybe I'll pull one hair out. If you pull an hair out of the, of the root, the sucking, the energy that the air gets from the skin or from the scalp, you disconnected it on Shabbat. It's not allowed. It's a sin. It's so the oraita. Just like you cut an orange from a tree or a branch or a leaf or grass from the floor with your hands, you pull it out. This is a surim the oraita. So the whole Shabbat, it stayed like this with his hand. Why? Accidentally, maybe I pull air one. The Rad Shamaim of the Chachamim. They understood what it means to commit a sin. Rav Chaim Ivolozhin, the student of the Gaon Mivilna, also accepted exile on himself. His wife said, oh, why are you going alone? I also want. <laughs> he said, no, no, stay home. It's going to be too difficult for you. You can stay home. You don't need exile. So from this we learn that a Jew has an obligation to chastise those who are arrogant or wicked. The, that's besides the point. That that's not what you learn from here. From here you learn that if somebody speak against the Talmud Chacham, you must protest fully against him, full force, with no hesitation and no fear and no shame. If you quiet, if you agree, then you become a criminal like him right away. If you disagree, but you say nothing about it, you're also guilty. That's what we learn. So his wife insisted to go with him to exile. So he said, I'm taking you in one condition. No matter what happened to us on the road, you will never say that I'm Rav Chaim Mivolozhin. Famous all, already all over the world, Nefesh Chaim. Because he was already famous, but nobody knew how he looked. Then when they arrived to a place of Chatan Vekala, it's interesting, it happened to his Rebbe, the same thing, Vigal Mivina. And something disappeared over there. They suspected Rav Chaim, because he's a stranger. Well, what are you doing here? You don't, you don't belong in this party. They put him in the middle of a circle and beat him up. His wife was looking at that from the women's section. She could not take the pain. She started to scream, leave him alone. So he told her, don't dare to say. <laughs> She's about to say who he is. So everybody understood that he said to her, don't dare to say where you hid it. <laughs> <laughs> so they hid him even more. Now even harder. But he took them all with love. But when his wife in the end just could not take the pain, because after all women are women, and the heart can take just as much as suffering, and she screamed, leave him alone, this is Rabbi Chaim Ivolozhin. As soon as they heard that, they all fainted. Fell on the floor. And when they woke up, they started to kiss his feet. <laughs> they started to cry. Wow. Forgive us, Rabbi. We're begging you, forgive us. He said to his wife, go back home. You did not keep your end in a promise. Oh. Rav Steinemann said, today the big righteous people do not have a need to go to exile. Why? Because the abuse comes and the shaming comes all the way to your home. Express, <laughs> FedEx. You don't have to go search for it. Remember, in the old days in town, no one will dare to talk against you. They know you're Chacham. So you can only get shame in places that people don't know who you are. But today, don't worry. Your own neighbors are going to write about your comments on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Rav Steinemann. So true. Kashkeviz, flyers, media, social media, newspaper. They'll do the job. They'll do the job.
רב חיים, אורח חיים, רבי חיים בן עטר, he went to exile. And he said, רב אורח חיים said about himself, that he declared that all the Torah that he wrote was all for the sake of heaven. And even when he was in exile, he continued to learn as usual. And he made 42 explanations to this pasuk, in bechukotai telechu, if you follow my laws. On Friday, he passed by the forest and he saw a Jew chopping a tree. Every time he hit the tree, he screamed, Lichvot Shabbat Kodesh! Remember, there was no ovens back then. Electric stove. Program, Shabbos program. People needed to chop trees and put them and, you know, cover it. Garuf v'katum, kira, make a hole in the ground, make fire, hoping that the, 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 the children will stay all night. It wasn't easy like today. Hey, Joe, Joey, yeah, I don't like my stove. What do you mean? I paid 10,000 for it. Remember I showed you a picture of the stove, $80,000, the one Hasid got here in Borough Park? $80,000 stove. I wonder how his chulen tastes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see, the whole time saw how this Jew said, Lechvod Shabbat Kodesh, boom, Lechvod Shabbat Kodesh. And he's alone, there's nobody there, so it's not a show off. He didn't see him, he was hiding behind. לכבוד שבת קודש השם, פשש, לכבוד... He was very impressed by him. That he's alone and he's declaring that he's doing it for the sake of heaven. So he asked him, Mr. Yid, can I be a guest in your house for Shabbos? I'm on exile running from one place to another and I'm looking for a place to be on Shabbat. Of course, he accepted him. He took him to shul with him. And he went to hear the, the speech of the rabbi of the shul. And the rabbi said, gentlemen, I just found out from Shamaim 14 explanations that the Ora Chaim said, Gdol Ador, and he doesn't know he's sitting in a crowd. Rabbi Chaim Ben Atar about this pasuk. And he said all 14. And, uh, and, uh, and he doesn't know, the, the, the host doesn't know that that's the rabbi. So he said, oh, it's true. That's what Rabbi Chaim Ben Atar said. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Who the heck you think you are? We don't need your approval, you know? So imagine this is Moroccan, so they have had blood naturally. So someone said, yeah, yeah. Rabbi Vadi himself used to get angry. That the Moroccans say, Emet Toratenu Akdosha. When I go up to the Torah, they finish the, the Kriya. Instead of saying, Baruch Atta Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Natan Lanu Torato, what they say? Before they say, Emet, Emet, true, our Torah is holy. So, we don't need your approval that the Torah is holy. Thank you very much that you approve it. Why he used to get angry? Because it's half sick. You make first bracha, you read in the Torah, and you have to say another bracha right away without extra words. That's an halacha argument. Anyway, this Moroccan host, he see that the guest is saying it's true. That's what Orachim, who do you think you are? What do you know Orachim? What are you giving me approval now? Top. <laughs> So the people around, they also heard, they got angry. He said, whoa, what is this? He calling him Chaim Ben Atar? Without saying, Rabbi, Kvod Arav, Gdol Ador, Arav Agaon. So the Rabbi said, shh, leave it alone. Who knows who this guy, homeless. He doesn't know anything from his life. Yeah. He's poor from the road. <laughs> the next day, the rabbi said, now I got another 14 explanations. He gave them, and he said, so Chaim Ben Atar actually said that also. <laughs> They're going crazy. <laughs> yeah. 
The third time in Seudah Shlishi, the Rabbi said the last 14. 14, 14, and 14, all together 42. And he said, yes, Chaim ben Atar said that also. And they couldn't forgive him anymore. They wanted to already beat him up. The Rabbi said, no, no, take him to the cage, lock him there. Rabbanim, we will teach him a lesson. <laughs> Moroccan style, <laughs> put him in a cage. <laughs> wow, 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 what's waiting for him over there? <laughs> Tov. So, the rabbi said, leave him over there until we see what we're going to do with the Motzei Shabbos. Motzei Shabbos, a storm started in town. Psh, trees falling, boom. Rockets, Hamas, Allah Akbar. <laughs> All kinds of problems. It was 250 years ago. More, more, 300 years ago. 300 years ago, trees are falling, roofs are falling. The rabbi that was very holy rabbi at Ruach HaKodesh, at night he saw that the Ora Chaim is captured in the end of his community. And he cannot do Avdala, and every Motzei Shabbos in Avdalah, he has in mind all the holy names. All the holy names in Kabbalah. And as results of that, there's a big storm in a place. Right, the way the rabbi said, go, go, take this man out of the jail. He so said, you or a Chaim HaKadosh and you don't tell us. <laughs> You don't, uh, by the way, it's interesting, this Or HaChaim HaKadosh became famous not only among Sfaradim, among Hasidim also, even Litaim. Everybody knows who he is, just like Rashi, it's everywhere. Sfaradim, Ashkenazim, Litaim, Hasidim. He's also like that. He went to all the world, all the communities, even Europe. So they found out who Ora Chaim is. The Gemara in Masechet Nida, page 36, the Gemara said there's a machloket there and Halacha is not like Rav. But Rav Shila used to do like Rav, but it wasn't Halacha like Rav. Before Rav passed, he called Rav Asi and he said, after my funeral, go to Rav Shila and tell him that I changed my mind. I'm no longer holding like I used to. So do not do like me. And if he will not agree to listen to you, give him all kinds of proofs until you convince him. When Rav was dying, Mamash moments before he died, he he already did not speak so clear. So instead of Geria, he said Gedia. Gedia means put him in Nidui, in isolation. So he understood that if Rav Shila will not agree to stop doing Allah like Rav, you should put him in isolation, in Cherem, in Nidui. Rav passed. After the funeral, Rav Asi called Rav Shila and told him, Rav said that you should do like Allah, not like him. And if not, I'm going to put you in Cherem, in Nidui. Rav Shila asked him, how do you say such thing? Even if Rav changed his mind, he would tell me that. He knows that I'm following all his halachot. I'm not accepting your words. So he said, in that case, he told me to put you in Cherem. I have to put you in isolation. Like Rav, like Rav told me to do. And he said, you're not afraid of my status? That I'll be upset at you? Like you're risking your life. And Rav Shila told him, you're making me unable to focus on my Torah. You're not afraid of a kpeda of a Talmid Chacham? Rav Asi said, no, I'm not afraid. I have schut avot. The merit of my fathers will protect me. And he said to him, I also have schut avot. So we even on that. So they keep arguing, and he put him in isolation. And right after that, he became sick and died. 
When Rav Shila found out that Rav Asi died, he said to his, to his wife, prepare for me clothes, I'm going to die. The things that you wrap the bodies. I have to join him soon. The wife told him why. He said, because Rav Asi will go up to heaven now and he's going to find Rav and he will tell about me that I killed him because I was strict about him putting me in isolation and I know that I'm going to have to go up there to fix the this, this, this story. His wife prepared for him linen. Linen, you put, you, you, when you bury the bodies, you cover them with linen. He wore them and died right away. They took him together with Rav Asi and made him a mutual funeral. A mutual funeral. The Or Chaim is asking, how can it be that Rav Shila came to his house and told his wife, I'm going to die? Since when a human being decide when he's going to die and when not? It's all, only Hashem knows the moment of death. Nobody knows when he's going to die. So how did he know for sure he's going to die? He told her, put me already in clothes and I'm ready to die with. <laughs> The Orach Haim said, if you devote all your life to Torah and nothing else, your entire life is Torah, whatever comes out of your mouth must happen. And he wanted to go. He said to his wife, I have to go. He died because of me. I don't deserve to leave. Put me this outfit and I'm going with him. That's what it means that the Talmud Chacham have superpower. I gave you a few examples of, of that, of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, that says in a, in a golf world that uh, in Bnei Brak nobody should wait online for hours to get a mask. Saddam used to sh was shooting 39 Scud missiles fell in Israel. Each Scud missile in the war between Iran and Iraq killed more than 800 people. He killed them with chemical weapon. He had chemical weapon, mustard, uh, gas, all kinds of gas. It was crazy. It was such a scary days. The size of a scud missile is from here to the end of that synagogue. That's how big it is. It falls in the middle of the city. It can kill thousands of people. So they ask of Chaim Kanievsky, should we, should we get this mask? It's protecting us from not dying. We breathe that, we're going to all choke. He said to them, no, sit and learn. Same thing today. Rockets are falling on the south. Later they started to fall around Tel Aviv, but in the beginning on the south. All the Avrechim ask, what should we do? Should we leave the yeshiva and go to the shelter? Or we should stay in yeshiva and learn? Everybody stay in yeshiva and learn as usual. Rav Chaim said. Do you know how scary it is to make such a decision? Imagine one rocket would fall and two that learn and kill them. That's the end of you. That's it. Everything you build in 92 years of learning and holiness, your, your reputation will be destroyed. He killed the people. He told them not to go. That's what the people are going to say. That's what they will remember in the end. No one will remember all the holiness and all the great things. But you see from here... Once he said something, Hashem makes everything goes around the world of the Chacham. Same thing with the vaccines. Some places in the world, people said that the vaccine caused them problem, even Pfizer and Moderna. But in Israel, nobody died. Five and a half million people got both vaccine, Pfizer and Moderna, nobody died. And to the best of my knowledge, nobody had any sickness as results, besides some minor symptoms. But And it brought Israel back to normal, you saw. Nobody gets corona anymore. Two weeks, nobody gets corona, nobody dies. The hospitals are empty from corona. Why? To prepare the hospitals for the Hamas victims. Ay, ay, ay. Rabbi Akiva, when he was 120 years old, the Romans put him in jail. 
he had a student, what his name was, Rav Yitzchak Garci, I think, Garci. He used to bring him a bucket of water every day. Half of the water he used to wash his hands before he ate the bread, and the other half he drinks. Every 24 hours he gives him one little bucket of water. One time the guard kicked the bucket. He said, you, got, you gave too much water today. You don't need, he doesn't need so much. Boom, he kicked it. Half of that spilled until he picked it up. He brought Rabbi Akiva half. Rabbi Akiva told him, why took you, what took you so long? Don't you know I'm an old man? I depend on this water. He said to him, the guard gave me hard time. Why did Rabbi Akiva saw that half of the water is wasted? The other half that left, he used to wash his hands. He said to him, what are you doing, Rabbi? You're wasting the water on the hands. You should drink. He said, I have to eat bread. That's the only food I get here. And what can I do that my friends, the Chachamim, they made a decree that you cannot eat bread unless you wash your hands. He is the biggest Chacham in the world and he does not dare to go against the order of the Chachamim. What are we going to say? We are better than him? Ah, that's the Rabbanan. Ah, that's Rabbi Nikel. Ah, Baruch Hashem, it's not the Deoraita. What's the punishment for not listening to Chachamim? It's one and a half times. Chayav Misa. One and a half times, true. Death, death penalty. Chayav Mita. Hashem is killing him. A lot of people die just because they make fun of the Chachamim. One question I have, and I would leave you with question. Let's see if you're going to come up with the answer by Monday. The Chachamim, the sages... Oh, Monday is the Shavuot, right? So next Monday. The, Tuesday. Tuesday, it's... Two, next yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday is the no, 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 wait, wait. Sunday night is Shavuot until Tuesday night. So next week there's no lectures. Following Monday, so in Queens, you maybe remember my question. The purpose of Chachamim making decrees is to reserve the Torah, right? For instance, David HaMelech and his bed Din made a decree that no one can be together, man and a woman, in a closed place. It's called Yichud. From the Torah, you could have been in the same room with a woman. You know you're not allowed to touch her, not allowed to look at her. She knows the same thing. You're both religious people, there's nothing to worry about. 300 years after the Torah was given, people started to be not as modest as before. When David HaMelech saw that that can shalom lead to a sin between a single boy to a single girl or even a married one, needless to say, he decided that they have to make a new decree. From now on, you're not allowed to be in a room that closed and locked or the shades are down, men and a woman together, married, single, doesn't matter. You're not allowed to close yourself in a place that other people don't have access to the place. That's already a sin. Why? If you know not to be together with a woman in a closed place, it will not lead to make a sin. That's called yichud. When you isolate yourself with someone or certain things that you're in the office and your boss say come in and he locks the door or close the door, that's not allowed. You have to leave the door a little open. Bottom line, if the windows are open and people pass by and see what's inside or the door is unlocked and people can walk in, that's no problem. If you give someone a ride, it's major roads with lots of cars, you leave the lights on, a man and a woman, she sits in the back, no problem, people look inside. So you have a guard. But if you're in the middle of nowhere, in a forest or in some place, you can't give her a ride over there. That's already not modest. So now, what was the purpose of the decree? To protect people for losing their share to the world to come. So let me make them far away from the scene. I don't even give them a chance to be isolated. From here it's already a sin. So if you walk into a room with a woman and you close the door and you close the sheds, already you're wicked. 
Now everybody already know you're not, an, you're not a righteous person. Nobody wants, uh, leave him alone, it's Rasha. That's what he's doing, Yichud. Now, if he says, I don't care, it's Rabbi Nikel, Rabbanan, I don't care. What's his punishment? Death. I don't get it. The decree was meant to save you from death or from karet. What benefit it is that the guards, the fans that the Chachami made, it's also death penalty. Do you understand? When I say to you, first offense, $100 fine. Second offense, one million dollar fine. First time, you get it easy, a hundred. Why? I already want you to understand that it's not allowed. You're gonna do it second time, you pay a million dollar fine. So the first one is making you scared to go far. But if the first one is already a million, so what did I do by that? I make you actually paid and died faster than what the Torah wanted you to die. So what kind of protection is that? Do you understand the question? So what, don't rush to answer. If I ask such a question, there's something to think about. We have to think about it. Even in every court today, first offense, easy punishment. Second, much, much more serious. If you don't have a criminal record, usually you will get away with that first time. After 30 times? No, even 30. Courtesy of Democrats, what do you want? Democrats destroys the world. I started to say in the beginning of tonight's lecture, that we have to limit 90% of democracy. We still have to vote the leaders, obviously, because we don't have a prophet of Hashem to tell us who Hashem wants as a leader. So we're still going to have to make an election. But once someone is elected, he has to run the show. He cannot go on with this circus anymore. Five elections, everybody says something else, 5,000 opinions. We need a king. He was elected to be the king, he makes all the rules, that's it. There has to be something different, why? Because today the prime minister has no power. Netanyahu wanted to declare a state of emergency in the city of Lut for the first time in Easter, Israel history today. Why? Hundreds of cars are on fire, synagogue is on fire, thousands of murderers, Arabs running in the street, burning, shooting, throwing, and with guns also. And he wants to bring the army into the city of Lud, like happened here with the riots. And the lefties don't let. Shem Reshaim Irkav. I told you, they are the real enemies. The damage they make is much more fatal than these Arabs. Because if he would allow Mishmar Akvul, 5,000 soldiers coming into Lud, in two hours there'll be. The Arabs will hide under, I don't want to tell you where because it's very aggressive soldiers. They break their bones. It would be probably 20, 30 death, because they would shoot at them and the soldier would shoot back at them. There would be a serious retaliation and it would be over. And they would think a million times if to do something tomorrow. Because the left is done let, they cooperate with them already for 70 years. It's not from today. Who knows what we're gonna get in the next few hours? Who knows what we got since this lecture started? The bombs right now. The bombs right now. 400 missiles. 400 missiles. Yeah, yeah. Here you go. Why is Hashem attacking that city, though? Why is he deciding to attack Lod? What's in that city that's so bad? I tell you why. I tell you why, Lord. You know why, Lord? Lord has thousands of Arabs, and unfortunately, some Jewish girls goes out with them. Inter not marriage, but inter relationship. So, the city of Lot and Ramle, same thing. Every city does a mixture of Jews and Arabs. Unfortunately, not Israel, some of them pass the line. 
Remember, these Arabs, they know how to pretend that they are Israelis. They put gel in their hair, earring. All the cities What's your name? Rafi. It's not Rafi, it's Rafik. What's your name? Yossi. It's not Yossi, it's Yusuf. You understand? That's what's going on. Remember, they're born in Israel, so they already know how to speak with Israeli accent. And that's a disaster for Bnot Israel. They give them drugs, they all have nice Mercedes, they don't pay taxes, a lot of them are in criminal gangs, they have tons of money, they drive fancy cars, a lot of them are mafia, it's mafia, there's neighborhoods, families, these gangsters, these gangsters, and also, by the way, fight each other, these Arabs. Everybody fights everyone, it's a, it's a zoo. What happened now, is it's a zoo. Believe me, Hashem knows what he's doing. We can only cry that we brought the world to such a situation. What we get now is still with the mercy of Hashem. But we have to cry why we force Hashem to give us such a punishment. That's all we have to cry for. And to do tshuva and to give a lot of tzedakah. I'm telling you, Rabotai, tzedakah will save you, your family, from chas v'shalom tragedies. The more tzedakah you give, the safer you will be. Better to be safe than sorry. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hananiah ben Akashia Omer.